All right. Good morning, everybody. That was pathetic. Come on. I said, good morning, everybody. If you're glad to be here, say, I am. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, man, it is good. Uh, we are now, what are these days? Are these days, I don't know if we're post-COVID, but we'll work on it, right? And so there'll be more and more people join us. Um, some people who shall remain nameless, Dennis Merker, has uh, been telling me, man, he has been on time every Sunday that we, he watches it online. But we always know there's a few people that show up late. So if you'll do us this favor, while we start singing here a little bit, if somebody comes in and they give you the look like, what this means is, is there an empty seat by you? If there is, you just you give them one of these, okay? Give them one of these. If they come in and, uh, and you don't have any space next to you, just act like you don't see them. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right, let's stand up, and uh, we will begin service this morning. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a passage of Scripture out of Second Chronicles. Isn't that the one I put on there? Travis, that's the one I meant to put on there. There it is. Second Chronicles 16, 9a. Uh, if it ever has like a number, 9a, the a means we're just reading the first half of the verse. If it says b, we're reading the second half of the verse. How about that? There you go, education. All right, here we go. You read the underlined part with me. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. What does that mean to us? What does that mean to you? What does it mean that God's eyes run to and fro? He sees everything. He sees it all. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. I don't know about you, but I could stand some of that. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that you do see us. That we do not worship a God that is aloof, that is distant, that doesn't care. But we worship a God that is here, that you speak to us, that you nestle down beside us. Holy Spirit, that you live within us. And so we thank you. We ask that today that you would be our strong support. We don't, we don't know what every person in this room is going through, but we can say with confidence that you love every person in this room, and that your desire is not only to have relationship with us, but to grow us close to you. But we ask that whatever we say, speak, and do in this room this morning would bring honor to the name of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. And everybody said...
God, we love you, and we thank you that you do reign, that you reign all of our days, and you reign all the days before us, all the days beyond us. And God, we thank you that you meet with us, that you've given us your word to be a truth and a guide because you love us. We ask that as we look into your word today that you would make it come so alive to us, God, that whatever you tell us to do, we simply do it. We love you, Father. We thank you in advance for working on our hearts today, and we pray this in Jesus' name everybody said you guys may be seated if you did not get one of the handouts this morning if you will uh, raise your hand somebody will bring you one there's Jamie Duncan what's up Jamie hey, you're sitting on the edge which means you're in the line of fire buddy <laughs> oh man it is good stuff um we get to talk today about everybody's favorite subject 
Sin! No, just, just, get, just, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? Miss Doc gave us a woo! That's right. Um, I, so in all the years that I grew up, I grew up in church, going to church, you know, lots of times people talk about sin. What you tell me, you, this would be the talk back section of this morning. You tell me, what do we know about sin? It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. Oh, hey, don't forget the little ones. Little ones, if you're between the ages of, oh, I don't know, kindergarten and third grade, we have this special thing for you next door where you get to go across the street. We get them over there. We teach them. They're going to get today's lesson on their own level, right? It's going to be good stuff. I have more stuff on my stand today than what I can do. But anyway, parents, if your little ones are going over there, they're going to be fine, right? You can go get them afterwards or stay for D group, and we do D I get to do D group with them today, so it'll be good stuff. Three boxes of Altoids. I mean, because really, how many can be too many, right? All right. <laughs> but i got to leave one up here. Just, that'll work. All right. So, I need you to, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 21. We're going to read verse 21. That's where we're going to start today. We started a series called, uh, it's on the disciplines, spiritual disciplines. And it's called Simple Things. The reason we call it Simple Things is because, it should be the most basic of all things of building our relationship with God. I think that for every one of us, we struggle as Christ followers of, to be close with God. And if I cannot get that thing down, then everything else trickles off of that. So we started by last week by saying that every one of us are personally responsible for our own actions. Each of us are personally responsible for our walk with God. Uh, I think it's important. That we have family that raise us. We, it is important that we, have, that we circle people around us that help encourage us to do the right thing. That's actually in a few weeks coming. We talk about accountability. But the place we begin is by saying that we are personally responsible. Second thing, though, today is I think before we can jump into the spiritual disciplines of praying and reading our Bible, I think you and I have to have a proper understanding not only that we are accountable personally responsible, but secondly, that we have a proper view of what sin is. So um, for me, it works this way. It's not that I understand God when I have a proper view of sin. It's the other way around. It's when I have a proper view of God, I begin to have a proper view of sin. I begin to see its effects and what it is on my life. And so uh, last week, I can't remember what we named it. Last week, it had something to do with I don't know. Oh, lawn darts and lawn, it was all the things that everybody outlawed because people were too stupid. Oh, use the S word, sorry. Um, too stupid, and so we outlawed all those things. It was lawn darts and something else. Oh, yeah, that's right, the, the, the clackers. You guys remember the hand clackers and then the sky dancers, right? Well, today it is duck calls, gunny sacks, and old spice. Are you guys ready? It's going to be fun. It is going to be a good time. I want to, by the end of this morning, we're going to talk about three things that are just the constants with sin. And then I want to, we're going to talk about what we do with sin. As a Christ follower, all the years I've been in church, most of the time when we talk or we preach or we teach about sin, what we do is we say, oh, yeah, don't do it, just stop it. Don't sin. Which I agree, I think, I, think, I think that's pretty good. That's pretty good, right? I was well into my 30s. Until I had somebody, and, and this is probably on me, I'm responsible. I'm responsible. But I was into my 30s before I had somebody explain to me, as a Christ follower, this is really how you deal with your sin. This is, this is not only how God sees it, this, this is not only what it costs you, but this, as a Christ follower, this is when you sin or when you have sin, this is what you do with it. This is how you respond, and this is how you walk with God. And so by the time we leave today, I hope that, and it's not complicated, it's not rocket science, it's not but I hope that you have a, a mental and a heart idea of this is how I deal with sin. Um, a pastor a long time ago, he told me, and I love this, he told me a long time ago, he said that sin is first against God's heart before it's against God's law. Shall we see So just soak that up for a moment. That sin is first against God's heart before it is against God's law. That was good for me because I was raised a great church, loving people. Uh, anything that's wrong, that's on me, not on them. But what I perceived growing up was is a whole bunch of rules and regulations. As long as I do this, as long as I do this, as long as I do this, as long as I follow all the rules, then everything will be copacetic. The reality is, is that relationship with God is relationship with God. It's not this set of rules. And so to understand that sin first breaks 
my relationship, the heart of God before it breaks the law of God. This, is a, this was a huge thing for me. And if we walk away, if you get nothing else today, if you get this, that I should not sin because it creates separation between me and my heavenly father. That's winner, winner, chicken dinner. So um, there are a few people in the Bible, most of them, who sinned right and their sin kind of has effects you guys know um in uh, joshua chapter was joshua chapter seven uh, joshua chapter seven is where achan remember the, they put the children of israel they get to go to the promised land and they woohoo they go start they tear down the walls of jericho they're all excited right and then they go to the next place they didn't seek god why because one old boy by the name of achan took some stuff and what did he do with it you guys remember what Achan did? He stole a, a robe and some gold and stuff. And what did he do with that? He buried it. What? Why did he bury it? He thought he could hide it. He thought he could hide it. Then there was David. King David. What did the great, the, he was the guy, the man after God's own heart. Right? And what did he try to do with his sin? Uh, uh, let me be more specific. He commits adultery. Huge sin. And then what does he try to do to cover that sin up? <laughs> he, he tries to do another sin. There are some, there are some biblical principles to sin. Uh, one of them that you guys have heard me teach a lot. I'm going to teach you a couple more this morning. But one of them that I go back to all the time is that sin by nature is degrading and degradatory. Those two things. And it means this. Degrading. That it always brings shame. Now whether you and I see it or not, but it always brings shame. A shame. I think that for me a large part of growing up, the reason that I flirted with sin or that I, it was appealing to me was because godliness was not championed as much as sin was. I was just told to, to not like it. And I think that as parents, any of us and parents in this room, that if you want your kids to grow up to be healthy Christ followers, that is not a pursuit of being perfect or good. That is a pursuit of Jesus. Does that make sense? It's not the, because all of us, we've made mistakes as parents. If you've been a parent for more than a day, you've made mistakes. It is not this pursuit of, I just don't want my kid to mess up. I just don't want my kid to mess up. I just don't want my kid to mess up. That's not it. It is a, pers a pursuit of, I just want my kid to know Jesus. I just want my kid to know Jesus. We're all going to make mistakes along the way. I'm not condoning sin, but let him with no sin stand and cast the first stone, huh? Okay. So, um... I hope that we have a different understanding of sin by the time we're done today. And so, um, duck calls. How many of you in the room like to duck hunt? God bless you. That's right. Um, duck hunting, I'm not very good at. But duck killing, I'm pretty good at. Do you know what the difference is? You know what, the, what is the difference? All right, so let me tell you what a, a typical day of duck hunting is. Because, I mean, you guys know I get into this, right? So, um, you guys know in Genesis chapter 3 when it says, and the snake was more subtle than any. And it came down and it lied to the woman. Do you know what the Hebrew word for snake is? It's duck. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. But that would make my whole, uh, my whole obsession for duck hunting even better. Okay. Right. So here's what we do. And duck Very first time I went ever duck hunting, I was in El Dorado, Arkansas. I went to Felsenthal. Go to this place. I'm with these guys. They get me up at like 2 in the morning. They said, this is going to be fun. I said, 2 in the morning? So we get up and they put all this stuff on. Now, I'm old enough and started going. The very first pair of waders I had on were canvas. Canvas. Now we have graduated. We have neoprene. And for those of us, we really, we have those. We have, what do we call those things? I got them. They're, they're uh, dry fit. What are they called? Insulated breathable. Thank you very much. Right? We, we've gone way past that. But I remember my first day. First day, first day, first day, first day. We go out there and we get there at, at 2.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning at the ramp. And there's people cussing and hollering at people. And I'm thinking, I don't know about this. There's fixing to be a fight break out because one guy says his boat was there first. What's the big deal? We finally get, we get in a boat. We make an hour-long trip. It's freezing cold. They're going mock four hours. The boom! Running the boat over stumps. Don't wear your waders in a boat. I'm being serious. I'll joke about a bunch of stuff, but don't wear your waders in a boat. Anyway, I digress. Finally gets where we're going. It's still dark. These guys are throwing out decoys. They're talking about how fun this is. How fun this is. It's cold. My fingernails are freezing off my hands. And they're talking about this is going to be so much fun. You just can't wait. You just can't wait. And I'm thinking, I'm ready to go home. Can we start the boat back up? It's cold. 
They stand me beside a tree. They stand me beside a tree and they say, when the ducks come in, don't look. Don't look? How am I supposed to shoot this thing if I don't look? What are we, praying and shooting? What is this? They said, no, the ducks can see your face. I said, you're telling me that this creature that's got a brain the size of a pea can understand that I'm looking at it and it's looking at me? They said, yes. So I, my first day I spent hunting like this. <laughs> I don't think I hit anything. Well, let me tell you where the change for me happened. We put all these decoys out. And it's just a piece of plastic. It's got paint on it. Doesn't it? Some of them don't even look like a duck. And these ducks started, and you could hear early in the morning, you hear their wings going, oh. At that time, I thought, I'm ready to go home. I just want to go home, Lord. I just want to be warm next to my wife. And the first time I saw these ducks, and this guy goes, meh, 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 meh. And that duck goes, Pow! and it cupped its wings and came in. I'm telling you what, I was hooked. The very first time, it was hooked. I, it's not the same for everybody. Some people's turkey hunting. Some people, it is clothes shopping. Mm -hmm. Right? Whatever it is, right? right? The first time I walked past that cell, all right, can I saw no, all right. <laughs> for me, the very first time, it was a God thing. The very first time I saw that dude, and I mean, they were wailing. Now, there are some guys, I'm going to give you a little bit. There are some guys, you might want to turn that off. Yeah, yeah, show what's in there. You want to turn it off, right? Some guys, when they do competition call, they go like this. to the we went to Stuttgart and listened to the championship calling and I thought I have been in the woods now for umpteen years and I ain't ever heard a duck do that never but you know what they do they just oh it is awesome let me tell you what Satan does Satan makes sin sound really good duck hunting is basically lying to ducks that's what we do it's lying to ducks. You know what I'm telling them? I'm real and I'm here. I'm lying to a duck. And I know some of you are like, so let me get this straight, Paul. The essence of duck hunting is you've got to be smarter than a duck. That's exactly what I'm telling you. They use all sorts of gadgets. They had the flying wing gadget. They had the, the spinner gadget. They had <laughs> things spitting water out to make it look like they were landing gadgets. They got all sorts of gadgets. Let me tell you this. Sometimes PJ is so good at calling ducks, they will sit down on the water right in front of us. Now, before we laugh too hard at that, isn't that exactly what Satan does to you and me? Satan makes sin sound so good, I can't hardly stand it. There'll be ducks. Now, in the whole duck hunting realm, trust me, we're not taking as long as on everything else, but on the whole duck hunting realm, you've got, you got your flyers, you got your sitters, right? The flyers, the ones that just kind of, they're just cruising, they're just meandering, they're just kind of looking around. But if you can talk to one of them and you can talk to them sweet enough, sweet enough, they will want to come see what you got going on. And that is exactly what happens to you and I. In life, we're just cruising along. We have no intention of sitting down in that spot. But Satan, man, 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 he sends something our way that sounds just good enough that we think, i got to go take a look at that. i got to go take a look at that. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 21. I got it. Proverbs 21, verse 21. Whoever pursues, what's the word pursue mean? Chase after. Pursue does not mean to, well, kind of walk along this way. Just kind of say what I say. Uh, you guys got behind those people at Walmart? Uh, I'll just stop. Just stop right there. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about? If you're going to Walmart, you should know what you're getting. But anyway, I digress. Right? But he pursues. Hebrew word pursue means to intently, with purpose, Direct focus and attention towards a specific thing. To go after it. To accomplish it. To fulfill it. The problem is not that God's love is not good. The promise is that you and I listen to what Satan throws out there. 
Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness. The word righteousness means those acts that are right standing before God. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness. Why do you have to throw that one in there? You know what I'm saying? How many of us would rather be right than nice? No. <laughs> Am I the only one? There's a bunch of liars in the room. You know what I'm saying? Most, most of the time we would rather be right than nice. Notice how he couples both. Righteousness and kindness. We'll find three things. Life, righteousness, and honor. So I want to share with you the three things um, that I think sin ha does. First one I've already shared has to do with a duck call. Sin lures me away from God's good, pleasing, and perfect plans. You guys know that Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says that you and I should, that we should allow God to transform us by the renewing of our mind. So that you and, and, and he, the first part of verse 1, he talks about how my life is to be an active worship. Live this active worship so that there's this transformation of my heart and mind. In verse 2, he, he concludes by saying, so that I will know both God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so several years ago, we, made a, a, we did a whole message series about that. And I bring it up often. That most of the time when people come to me and they say, hey, Paul, I just want to know God's will for my life. God's will is made up of three things. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it's made up of three things. That which is God's purpose, which God's purpose is to glorify Him, put Him first, love Him first, follow after Him. God's purpose in my life is His glory. His glory. The second thing is God's ways. God's ways I get from God's Word. If I try to figure out God's ways apart from God's Word, I will always get Paul's ways. Third thing, though, is God's plans. God's plans are, what am I supposed to do about this house? What am I supposed to do about this job? Who am I supposed to marry? Where are we supposed to live? Where are we supposed to go to church? What are we supposed to do? What I have found most often is if we follow the plan that God gives, surrender to His purposes, follow His ways, then you and I can know His plans. What I have found as a pastor for 25 years is that it becomes much easier. I won't throw you under the bus. I'll taste the rubber from the tires myself. It becomes much easier for me just to skip over the purpose and the ways part and start asking God for the plans. God, can you just tell me what you want me to do? But it doesn't work that way. God's plans are revealed as I surrender to his purposes and as I follow his ways. So the first thing is that sin lures me away from God's purposes, God's principles his view right and his plans sin lures me away from that it makes it sound so much better in a very literal sense when we're duck hunting we're making the sound of a female duck and we're lying to all the male ducks and telling them we're the real deal and we are better and we are not because i fling number three size uh i saw almost said lead <clears throat> i'm on video three number three steel steel at the ducks why because they're of the devil. No, just kidding. They're just kidding. Some of the kids are going to go home today and say, Mom, why did Pastor Paul say that ducks are of the devil? It's a long story. All right. So, number one, he tries to lure us from anything that is God's plans. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a real quick survey. Ten seconds in your own mind. Ten seconds in your own mind. What are the last things that Satan tried to lure you away from? Wife, kids, job, yourself. What are the last lies that Satan has told you? You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. I don't like you. You don't like you. Nobody likes you. If you think about it, Satan lures us away. And every time we are lured away by sin, it causes us to see God differently. It causes us to see ourselves differently. Um, it is important that you and I would understand what God says about sin. And I don't want to be that pastor that always says that, well, sin is bad. It is bad, but why is it bad? Right, so as a daddy, as a daddy. So if I tell my kids, and, and I am responsible, until my kids get married, I am spiritually responsible, or until, until they become adults, spiritually responsible for them, right? And I'm responsible for them in a large way financially. So my kids come to me and they say, hey, we want this. And I say, well, I would like you to do this. And they purposefully, willfully disobey. And I choose to discipline them. Does that mean that I don't love them? As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. Love disciplines. Doesn't God say that he disciplines, right? 
But what does that desire to disobey, where is that coming from? Well, it's coming from somebody telling my kids, well, your dad and your mom, they don't know what they're talking about. They, they, don't, they don't know what the real world is like. They don't know what's really going on in life. Isn't that all sin begins with this lie? Mm. Which is the second thing. Satan's, number two, is that Satan desires to give us lies that pull us away. Second thing is, sin is a lie that promises what it will never deliver. Now notice, um, there is, there's sometimes fun in sin, but it doesn't last for a season. Um, um, isn't it amazing how like on this whole scale of sin, we, talk, we think of some things are worse and better, and like uh, we, we, we rename things. We recategorize them. Are you ready? That, that was just a little white Fill in the blank. What is a little white lie? It's still a lie, isn't it? It is still a lie. But don't we make it sound better when we say, yeah, it's not so bad, it's just a little white lie. So you guys know that I do uh, a lot of addiction counseling and I do uh, come from family of addiction, have struggled with, so pot kettle, pot kettle, pot kettle, pot kettle, right? I was dealing with somebody not too long ago and they said, all it is is I'm just doing a little marijuana and some alcohol. Isn't it funny how, how we march, we trivialize those things? I'm just doing a little marijuana. And when somebody says something like that to me, I, 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 I have a hard time not laughing because you guys know I'm the black and white guy. I'm straightforward. What are they really saying if somebody goes, eh, well, I fixed you supper, but I just, I just put a little dog food in there. It's just a little dog food in there. Kind of adds it some, some texture. It's just a little dog food. What do you think? It's still dog food. Could you eat that meal? If I had convinced you that I made meatloaf, but I only used one cup of dog food, how many of you could sit there and not think, I'm eating dog food, I'm eating dog food, I'm eating dog food, I'm eating. How could you do that? You can't. But yet we do that with sin because we believe a lie. I think that sin tells us lots of lies. Sin tells us lies about ourselves. Sin tells us lies about other people. Sin tells us lies about the outcome of stuff. And so, um, you guys know I'm never one to paint or skirt around things. The number one problem with men in church in the United States is pornography. Men, love your wives as God loved the church. Love your wife as God loved the church and gave himself up for her. This, this is a huge, you want to talk about a pandemic. You want to talk about something. We must, we must not believe the lie from Satan. I'm going to give you, and this is just free. This is like little bits on the salad bar on the side. This isn't even part of the message. Here it goes. I'll give you three reasons why men should not look at pornography. Number one, because God says not to. Do not look after a woman to lust after her, for this is sin. Number two, because it will ruin your sex life inside your marriage. And the whole reason why you think you're looking at pornography to begin with is because you think you want to have better sex. So, number two, it, it will ruin your relationship. Number three, it will ruin your relationship with every other female that you look at. Now, does any man in this room disagree with me? Every, all the men, we just got like big mouth frogs. Ooh, was that so? reality is we must not believe the lie from Satan whether it has to do with pornography or anything else what, no matter what the issue is we must not allow Satan to lie to us that it's not that bad because that, isn't that how it sounds it's not that bad eh, it's not that bad it is I have found myself saying this I told my kids growing up they loved it they loved it if you ever tell me it's not that bad guess what but it ming 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 it is if you ever have to convince me that it's not that bad, it is that bad. It's that bad. All sin separates us from God, which leads me to the third thing. So the whole thing about gunny sacks, uh, let, me, let me finish that, that it lies to us. Do you guys know where the whole thing, the saying, the cat's out of the bag came from? Have you guys ever heard that phrase, cat's out of the bag? All right, so way back in medieval times, what they'd do is they'd go, to the, they'd go in and they would go to get animals, small pigs or whatever, and they would put them in a gunny sack, tie them up, and then take them home. 
those people, they found that they had cats and dogs and they would muffle them, tie them up and put them in the sack and send those people home with cats and dogs instead of with pigs. But they wouldn't open it until they got all the way home. If they opened it before that, whoops, the cat is out of the bag. They knew the person had lied to them so they would go back to the guy that they were supposed to have gotten pigs from and they would say, hey, I don't want no stinking cat. I want a pig. Now, How many times have you and I sinned and we get way too far down the road before the cat's out of the bag? By the time you and I are willing to say that well, this is what sin has really done in my life, it's created all sorts of havoc. Third thing, though, is that sin stinks. And it goes back to Old Spice. Old Spice! How many of you in the room ever had Old Spice? I did. I'm going to be honest. Not this new stuff. Not this new Old Spice. You can't call the new Old Spice. It should be called something different. But the <laughs> new Spice. Well, oh, anyway. Old Spice. My first recollection of Old Spice was my granddad, Taylor. Granddad, Taylor, would go in there. And, um, and, and I was a little boy. I'd go stay at his house during the summers. And he had this cream-colored bottle that had this, sa this sailboat on it. The sails. The sailboat on it. And it had a little cork thing in the top of it. And you pull it out. And it smelled like... Man, that smells like granddad. That's granddad right there. That is granddad. I remember the, one of the very first times granddad ever let me shave. I was a little boy, had no business shaving. And, you know, you, you run that razor across your face because you want to be a man like granddad was, you know. And so you kind of shave and do that stuff. And he goes, here, let's put some old spice on it. And I remember when he put that old spice in his hands and he, he patted my little cheeks and, ha! Ah! Because old spice is about 95% alcohol. Those are my earliest recollections of Old Spice. But you move on from there and you get into high school. And when you're a young man and you don't want to take a shower, what do you do? You just Old Spice it. Right? Right? They came out with a new stuff for a younger generation. I remember when my son was growing up, it wasn't Old Spice. It was this thing called Axe. Axe. I'm telling you what, what would they do? What would the teenage boys do? No need for a shower. We'll just axe it off. Whoa! Man, and they have all sorts of things. They would spray it and walk into it. They'd spray it down inside, under, over, over, on top, right? They'd ax it away. Isn't that what happens with sin? And I, I say that in jest. I say that in jest. But isn't that what happens with sin? Because once I sin, I have to do something to cover it. Once I sin, I have to do something to cover it. Once I cover it up a little bit, then I cover it more, then I cover it more. Typically, that falls in the line of lying. But there are lots of things. Remember, sin by nature is degradatory and degrading. Degrading brings shame. Degradatory means it gets worse and worse. So with those three things in mind, <coughs> I want to share with you two thoughts. <clears throat> How the spiritually mature deal with sin. They're not complex. They're super simple. <clears throat> Isaiah 50-20. Or not 50. Isaiah 5-20. I'm going to give you a second to turn there because I'm going to ask that you would underline this in your Bible. Isaiah 5.20 If you like to do the thing where you underline things in your Bible, underline them. Woe to those, what does woe mean? Well, I guess it could mean stop. Whoa. That's not the woe I'm talking about. I guess it does mean woe. I, I, guess it means, I, I, guess it does, I guess it does mean stop. But what else does woe mean? What? You better, you better watch out. You better stop it. You better recognize. You better listen. Okay. Woe. Listen. Pay attention. Stop what you're doing and give careful attention to. Woe. Woe to, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. The first thing is that you and I must agree with God. We must agree with God. We must agree with God what God says is sin, what God says happens because of sin. We must agree with God what sin, how it affects us and how it affects others. And we cannot be, be on this rampage to placate or make anybody else feel better about their sin. 
You guys know I'm as black and white as they come, and I want to love people towards Jesus. I make mistakes. I really do stand here as the chief sinner in this room that is not self-deprecation. You guys know I make mistakes, but my desire is to chase after Jesus. And we as a church family want to chase after Jesus, but we don't chase after Jesus by excusing sin in our culture or sin in our own lives. And it begins with us. It begins with us. If there's anything that is in me that I say, yeah, but, I have started to placate and started to say, well, no, it's okay. You and I must agree with God what God says is sin. Now, we can't say what sin isn't. I was watching a doctor, a doctor, a doctor, boy, I started making a new word, a documentary. That's how we say it. Can't spell it, but I can say it. We start, I read, I watched a documentary the other day on a different religion, and they were in Belize as you would have it, and they were moving to Peru because they wanted to be uh, more uh, separate from everybody because they felt like the current people in their religion were uh, messing everything up, and so they wanted to be completely separate from all, all ties, no people, no humanity, just them, so that they could have a perfect utopia in this religion, and in doing so, um, one guy said, Well, the Bible says that women have to wear clothes this way and that men have to wear clothes this way and that women cannot wear makeup and that men have to wear hats. And he went on to this whole thing. I thought, what Bible is he reading? And then he went on to say that we have to worship on Sunday. And he started making up all these things in the religion that they say the Bible says we have to do that. And I'm scratching my head going, where does it say that? We as humans have become so good by telling God what he meant. That's tweetable. That's, that's just, push, just throw it out there. Have we, we have become really good at just telling God what, what he means. What if you and I just rely on what God says? Let's agree with what God says and then go from there. Agreeing with God about sin. And this, this Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What they're saying is, you better watch out. If you personally, and then you as a culture, get to the place where you try to tell people that what is really evil is good. And you try to say, what is good to him is evil. We must agree with God. This is, this is the pinnacle for me of what, if somebody says, Paul, what is sin 101? Just agree with God. I get people ask me all sorts of questions all the time. Is this a sin? Is this a sin? What about this? What should I do in this situation? It's like, hey, go to God's word. Hey, should I handle this with my family? How should I handle this with my job? How should I handle this with my finances? Go to God's word. All I can tell you is agree with God about it. Agree with God, and he'll make his way plain. It's not like God's trying to hide it from us. He's not. The second thing, though, um, that I get, not only that we must agree with God. And and, and a part of that, before I go into number two, I'm going to stop myself, is that I think that you and I have to champion goodness. It's not good enough to just not do the wrong thing. We have to champion goodness. And so let's play a little game, a little talk back section this morning. Well, here we go. Are you ready? Play a game. How do we champion godliness in our homes? How do you and I, how do we champion godliness? Whether we are a high school student, a college student, a parent without kids, parents with kids, grandparents, get the kids out of the house. How do we champion godliness in our home? You got to know what it is. We're on Raider stepping on toes, dude. All right. He said you got to know what it is. How do I know what godliness is? Live it out. How do I know what godliness is? God's word. I go to God's word. How else do I champion godliness? Who? Grace. She's been dead for 30 years. No, just kidding. That's a reference to a movie, right? Sometimes though, sometimes though grace is a lost art, huh? Sometimes it's easier for us to give grace to people that we don't even know than it is to give grace in people who are in our own house. See, I, I think when I think of living out this whole um, championing godliness, I think of being honest at home and honest elsewhere. I know this is going to come to a surprise to you guys, but I'm a little bit competitive. 
own it. Whether it's sports or whatever, I get, I, get, I get super passionate about it, right? Now, I can't say, well, God made me that way, so I can just be hateful and rude to people. No, that's, that's not how it works. But for me to live out godliness, for me to champion godliness, means that I always try to love people more than I love winning. I love truth more than I love trying to be right. I love forgiveness and peace more than I love being right. I love my wife and my kids more than I love myself. Number one problem in America is daddies. Fellas, if you feel like I'm stepping on your toes, I am. Number one problem in America is daddies. Defunct, lost, not there, not caring, not exemplary, gone. I believe the way that we champion godliness is that we be the people that God's called us to be and then our kids will long to be like us. Is it somewhat of a sad state of affairs when we raise a generation of kids who say, I want to be anybody but like my parents? Mm. Second thing, though, is this. Not only do we agree with God, but the second thing is we repent when we do sin. We repent when we're wrong. And this comes to the heart of what do we do. This was a part that I was never, I guess I was taught, but it was never really hammered. It was never really explained. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess. The if is a choice. It means that I, I have a choice to confess. I can continue to live in sin, put berries around myself, tell everybody else that what I'm doing is not sin. Somebody else agrees with me that it's okay, and I, I can choose to not believe God's word. But if I'm going to follow God's word, if I'm going to repent, if I'm going to live with him, close to him, next to him, then if, then I have to make a choice, if we confess. The word confess doesn't just mean to say, I'm sorry. How many of you guys have ever, I mean, how many of you have ever had your kids say, tell, tell them you're sorry? And then what do they say? I'm sorry. Warms the heart, huh? I'm sorry. If we confess to admit that we're wrong, to ask God to forgive us, and then turn the other way, that other way, turning the other way is called repentance. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there are two words in there that have continuing participles with them. The one is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and to cleanse us. What that means is that God promises when I enter a relationship with him that he will forgive me of everything I've ever done, of everything I am doing, of everything I will do. So it's not that when I sin, I lose my salvation, but when I sin, I lose my closeness. And I'll give you this example, and then I'll close. Let's say that, and God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, I have great kids. I love my kids, and they are very gracious because they let me use them as examples a lot. Um, but let's say that one of my kids said, you know what, Dad, I don't care about you anymore. You and Mom and Dad, you've got it all wrong. We don't believe you. We don't trust you. We don't like you anymore. They move off. One of them moves off to Las Vegas to live a life of whatever. Has my love for them changed? Not at all. I love them every bit as much. Has their experience of my love changed? Oh, you better believe it. There ain't, more, there ain't no more, and ain't is bad English, but it's coming, right? There ain't no more money here and helping with this and showing up to do this. There ain't no more of that. Why? Because I'm mad at them? No. Because I love them. So let's, let's lay this over there. Um, so if they repent... And they say, God, I'm sorry. And they say, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. And they come back to us and ask forgiveness. What happens? Relationship is restored. Again, has my love for them changed? Has their experience of my love changed? Absolutely. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what I see. 
time and time in Scripture, woven throughout Old Testament and New Testament, the way they did the sacrificial uh, process, the way that Jesus came, what he did, and everything that Jesus said and everything that Paul said and what James says and what Peter says. Everything ties together. To me, it, it works this way. That when I begin a relationship with Jesus, if I, if I will admit to him that I am a sinner and that I cannot earn my way to heaven, I can only get to heaven by trusting the blood of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is all God. He came to earth and lived as all man and all God, lived a perfect life, died on a cross and rose again. And if I will surrender to that truth and say, God, I trust that Jesus is who he said he was. And I invite Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I don't care what words you put it in. I don't care whether you walked an aisle or whether you were in your car. If that is the attitude of your heart, that God promises that he writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But it comes with this thing called repentance. Because it's one thing to note that I did something wrong and say I'm sorry. It's another thing to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus in my life. And to say, not only am I sorry, but I trust what you have for me is better than what I can get on my own. Not only is that the way that we get saved, that is the way that we as Christ followers live. So when I got really angry last night at a volleyball game... I had to ask my wife to forgive me. I wasn't mad at her, but I had to ask my wife to forgive me. I had to ask those around me to forgive me. I even went up to the referee who didn't hear me. Well, who am I kidding? They hurt me. <laughs> right? But I asked God first. And in, and in this repentance, there can be reconciliation. That's how we as Christ followers deal with sin. We admit it. We're honest about it. We ask God to forgive us. We ask others to forgive us. And then we do our best not to do it again. And then, then this is the process for becoming a mature Christ follower. An immature Christ follower tries to cover their sin. They try to hide it like what Achan did. Or try to blame someone else. But as a Christ follower, I want to see sin the way that God sees it. I want to agree with him about sin. And then I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I stay repentant. Because I heard a guy one time, he said this, there's only two kinds of heart, a repentant heart and a rebellious heart. You pray with me, please. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, here in a moment, we're going to give us an opportunity to pray. And If you want to come pray up the front, you're certainly welcome to do that. If you want to pray at your seat, you're certain, certain welcomely, certainly welcome to do that. Uh, but... We believe that unless we're a praying church, we will never be a significant church. Significance is not found in numbers, but it, it's found in obedience. Significance is found in simply being who and doing what God has called us to do. So my prayer this morning is that each of us would do some introspection. That we would ask ourselves, God, is there anything that I need to confess to you? God, is there, any, is there anything that I need to ask forgiveness of? so that I can be close to you. Lord, I ask this morning as we spend time taking a real, honest account of our own life, Spirit, would you speak to us and just help us to be honest what you speak about. give us an opportunity this morning for God to guide our heart. So in the next few minutes, 
whether it is praying at your seat or praying up front, whether it has to do with confession, or whether it has to do with us just pouring our heart out to God over something that we desperately need, I invite us as church family to spend this time talking to our King. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed while there are folks praying uh, with nobody looking around. Could I? Um, if you would say, hey, Paul, I, I, I believe things are right with me and God, but there is someone that is super heavy on my heart, whether it's a family member, a grandchild, a child, a parent. God, there is somebody extremely heavy on my heart at this very moment as, as we talk about all this stuff. Not that they have done sin, or maybe they have, I don't know. But God has put somebody on your heart, whether it has to do with a physical ailment or whatever it is. With nobody looking around, could I ask you to just quietly raise your hand? Just raise it high. Raise it high. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for every hand that is raised, for every person that is represented by every hand that is raised. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would, that you would be... God in every situation in a way that makes it obvious that you love, that you convict, and that you guide. Lord, for every person, I pray that you would show yourself in such a way that the one holding their hand up right now recognizes that you are working in that situation. To you be the glory and to you be the honor. You may put your hands down. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you're here this morning, you would say, Hey, Paul, I'm, I've been to church, maybe haven't been to church. I've heard of God, maybe I haven't heard of God, but you've never come to the place where you've trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about if you believe in God. It says in James 4 that even, even Satan believes God exists. I'm talking about coming to a place where you admit that you're a sinner, that you're willing to repent, to turn from yourself and from your sin and say, I give myself wholly to Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, you've never done that. I, I want to tell you that we would love the opportunity to be able to walk through that with you. I, I'm not going to call you down front. It's not our desire to embarrass anyone. We want to be able to have a conversation with you that is both intellectual, but from the heart. Because your eternity is worth a conversation. But if you would be a person here this morning and, and that, that feels that way, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is that you would either put it on the back of one of the cards in front of you, if you would just mark on there, hey, I'd like to know more about becoming a Christ follower. Or you can text me or email me or, or, or say something to the person that you came with or that you know here. But we would love to be able to have a conversation with you about that. Because being a Christ follower is not just saying certain words. It is commitment and an attitude of the heart. Lord, I pray that as we worship you this morning, may you be well pleased in us, Father. Would you stand to your feet, please?
without you I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. The grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I Christ in me.
tell somebody you've been at church today that's all I can tell you right man if you are a guest with us we appreciate you spending time with us today if you'll fill out on a note card and put it in the box in the back I promise to send you a thousand dollar bill just kidding but I'll pray for you I love you guys we have D group so if you guys want to hang out for D group we do that right here and Wednesday night we do Wednesday night Bible study youth Bible study and then college Bible study anyway we love you guys have a great week you're dismissed